Buonasera a tutti, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Andrea Campioli and as Dean of the School of Architecture, Urban Planning and Construction Engineering, I welcomed Alejandro Aravena, Pritzker Prize 2016 and full professor in architectural design at Politecnico di Milano, a department of architecture in Dunbar Style since last year. Today, Professor Aravena begins his teaching activity at our school with an advanced architectural design studio taught for the students of our master's degree courses in architecture. 45 students will have the opportunity to attend the studio in this semester. But I am particularly grateful to Alejandro for his willingness to open his first lesson to all the students of the school. I hope that the presence of Alessandro, Alejandro Aravena in our school, his theoretical thinking and his design experience can push all our students to become passionate about some themes that architectural design must urgently address today. The aspects that make Alejandro Aravena position about architecture a strong reference for our school and for our students will become clear after today's lecture and the introduction by Matteo Poli. However, I would like to highlight at least three points of our experience fascinating the cultural project of our school. First, the continuous search for a dialogue between people and architecture. In Aravena's project, people are considered active subjects involved in designing and building the spaces they will inhabit. Second, the particular interest in using alternative, recycled, and locally sourced building materials to address environmental concerns and reduce construction costs. <laughs> Lastly, the attention to cross-disciplinary collaboration, promoting bridges between different disciplines and bringing together experts in architecture, engineering, social sciences, and other fields to address complex urban challenges. I don't want to waste uh, any more time. I thank you again, Alejandro, for this lecture, uh, for the work that he will carry out with our students. And I leave the floor to Massimo Bricoccoli, Director of the Department of Architecture and Urban Studies. Thank you. I'll spend just a few word, words to welcome Alejandro Avena, this time publicly. <laughs> so it's the first uh, public uh, lecture that Alejandro is giving in our school. And I would just say that in these weeks, while we have been a bit supporting uh, his entering into the academic year, into the, the studio, it was very interesting to understand once again how the uh, fact that he's based in our department, so it's a research department, but teaching in the school. And this uh, for us is more and more uh, relevant because what we have been discussing with Alejandro, with Matteo Poli, supporting his choices regarding the studio, deal a lot with our research work. So we are glad that the students can profit from his contributions, but our research uh, activity as well and very much. So there is a resonance which is very much an on an international level that uh, he can give to our department and vice versa we can contribute also working on Milano working in a different context this can definitely be enriching for everybody so thank you again thank you I want to become Dean only to be first in introduction because being third is always a bit embarrassing <laughs> not much to say more Uh, we started today with the students in classroom and it uh, was uh, uh, fantastic to see how uh, Alejandro built up tension in terms of uh, what the questions are, what the answers are, uh, what doubts uh, we should have uh, when designing. All his research uh, somehow fits uh, what we do in the school and uh, I think it will be uh, a great uh, week for uh, students that are here now and What is now, what is for me interesting is that it will be a sequence of, of experiences. So it's not a workshop that happens now, but it will be part of the school. So I'm really looking forward to the toolbox that Alejandro is proposing as an instrument to work with. 
uh, to use his office as a background uh, and not like a protagonist, but the way he works in the office uh, as the tool that he will bring into the school. So it was easy for us to name his uh, uh, workshop, uh, his design studio as Elemental Design Studio, because somehow, somehow is uh, responding to what he also does in Chile on many different projects, not only of architecture, but of uh, research as well. So thank you, Stops, uh, the, uh, stop the talking, and I leave the stage to Alejandro. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, for being here this afternoon. Um, so <coughs> the, uh, when we were discussing with uh, Massimo and Matteo uh, a possible title for this, and I would not call it a lecture, and actually not even a conversation. I would say is the start of a conversation. So I actually have one introduction and then maybe 10 or 12 projects that are actually it's uh, what we're working on right now. Uh, but the idea is to pick up maybe one or two, or maybe three. Uh, if you then have answers and questions and may use one of the projects to answer those questions, but then we have not only the rest of the semester, we have all the years to come here to keep on talking about those projects in depth. Normally in a lecture, you don't get the behind the scenes, the in between the lines, the failures, the doubts and all that. So I, I hope I will be able to share a little bit of that with Con. Uh, so there's no, no hurry uh, in, in that sense. Uh, the idea of the toolbox actually uh, came from, and the introduction will be about how I personally went from the studies I did or the training I received in the university in the mid 80s in Chile that was focusing on one possibility of architectural practice and then how that toolbox I received as an education uh, I felt was uh, missing some tools because there were much uh, much more questions beyond the range I was taught and then the idea would be to share it with you how we have been trying in the office and still today to add more tools to that toolbox because the challenges are, are new, are changing and dynamic and uh, we may use some of the old tools but sometimes we require new ones. So in principle the lecture today will be about the the toolbox regarding the architectural practice and the range of possibilities of the practice uh, for an architect that we ourselves have felt had to have to keep on being expanded because we normally fall short in what we been asked to uh, deliver as a possible solution to the uh, briefs that we receive. But then in the, in the studio, uh, the idea, and this is what we started doing this morning, is <coughs> Also, I, at least I, that was my case, I was trained as an architect to work uh, with a specific way of receiving a commission. There would be a brief, and then the training I was receiving, you use it to respond to the brief. But what happens when there's no brief? What happens when the challenge is not even the client who knows what is the brief? after the earthquake and, and tsunami in Chile in 2010, in principle, we couldn't be hired as a private practice because it had to follow a public bidding process. But in order to conduct a public bidding, you need to have the terms of reference for that public bidding. And the client didn't know what to ask for that competition. So there are so many cases nowadays where you have a problem, and the question of the studio is based on, on your research on a Milano that cannot be afforded by students camping in tents or by the dancer at the Scala or by the IT guy at the Politecnico. This is a, a challenge that doesn't have a brief. What do we do? That, it's not that somebody knows and then we architects go and do something. Uh, we have to come up with a strategy to understand the question before jumping into the answer. Uh, so what I've been, we will be doing and what I've been trying to share, and hopefully some of that goes to the conversation uh, this afternoon, is how many strategies or what do you do when there's no brief? How do you tackle a, an, 
urban challenge or the built environment question when there's no clear request from anybody of what needs to be done. Uh, so th this is uh, uh, the idea of the possibilities of the conversation. At some point, I, at the first half, and it will depend on how patient you are, uh, uh, we start with open up, up to questions and then we see uh, how we move forward. So uh, that being said, I think it, we all more or less know that the built environment goes from slums, informal settlements, that's the case for two billion people in the world, and or cities that in 2010, uh, so in 2007, was the first time in human history where we had more people living in cities than on the countryside. So the process of urbanization, it's, uh, it's becoming more and more relevant. Uh, so the spectrum, the range of potential uh, practices for an architect has all this thing. But in the mid-80s, at least what I was trained for, uh, the, the education I received was more or less uh, to deliver solutions from private houses to buildings. That, that was the, the education at least I received. Politecnico may be a different uh, uh, attitude towards education, but that was I got uh, in the mid 80s. And uh, accordingly, you more or less intuitively, last years of the dictatorship, and you want to, you know, prove that the authority wrong in whatever possible way. So if the university was asking in a workshop to do private houses, and in principle you would choose a sculptor or a filmmaker or a philosopher on the assumption that the better the client, the better the architecture, uh, I was testing, so what if I do the house for a taxi driver? Uh, can, can we challenge the education we were receiving for architecture with a capital A with an architecture that is for the uh, average person that has no clue what who Heidegger is and puts the refrigerator in the living room because it's a sign of status? What are we doing as architects to engage with that reality? So it, intuitively there was something that was missing in between houses, private houses and buildings and uh, Again, and only intuitively, uh, I, I was trying to go beyond uh, what I was being taught. Uh, but then after graduating in 91, I felt that instead of uh, widening the range, I felt that I had to go deeper into that education because if you go and, and in principle, we're trying to do buildings, why, why don't interrogate building themselves? If, if those are the professors, I mean, buildings contain uh, two things, a process of construction and uh, the, the moment. Uh, and this is what I, I, I asked for a scholarship in, in, uh, in Italy from 92 to 93 uh, to make as if I was studying in, in Italy. But the reality is that I had so many buildings to draw and measure. And the question of measuring buildings is that you somehow are walking on the footsteps of somebody that had to take the decision in front of the blank page. The distance between columns, how wide, how high, how tall uh, was the structural system. There are many design decisions that you can you know, reverse engineer from measuring and building, the mo uh, measuring and, and uh, drawing. When you're drawing, you understand the forces you know, going from uh, a, you know, a ton up there going to the foundation, you, you see or you kind of feel while drawing that. So uh, that was what I felt was missing in my education where I was studying architecture only with photocopies of books. There's no big architectural tradition in Chile. Uh, so when I came to Europe, uh, I went immediately to Sicily to measure all the uh, Doric temples and then also, uh, well, in general, Mediterranean architecture. So when I, I graduated, uh, the practice I, I entered was already not covered by what I studied. So uh, it was outside, in, and, and I wouldn't say it was a choice, at, at least in my case, when I graduated, you just work in whatever. Uh, and that whatever 
is in my in case was bars, discotheques, uh, um, shops uh, that luckily disappear. They're all gone, uh, but they they proved to be instrumental for two reasons. First, uh, you get rid of that design anxiety if you're taught to display you know, how talented and skillful you are. Uh, and then you get a commission from uh, adding a mansard on top of the roof of a relative, and then you come with, you know, a very flashy thing, it's not pertinent. And uh, so it's good that on all these uh, very stupid commissions, you get rid of all those forms that you had there. Uh, and when you jump, when I was, finally jumped into architecture a couple of years later, all that had already gone out of that anxiety. Um, and then you answer with what is the case, not just to show off what you're able to do. The second important thing is that <coughs> uh, in that period of time, um, I was, let's say, designing and with a group of workers and builders, and when I say a group, it's two or three, and mainly a welder, uh, so after you design, then we were on the construction site and I was the assistant to, to the welder. So first you are, let's say, the boss of the welder and you tell what to do. The week later, the, the boss is the welder. And then the welder blames on the designer by why did you do this thing? I can't not even put the hand inside that angle over there because there's not enough space for the screwdriver for plus the welding. So you learn the hard way that one thing is to draw, another thing is to build it, and that experience of having the problem of physically, or translating into physically uh, the drawings you're doing, uh, it was so healthy. I mean, a another way to get rid of all the um, unnecessary moves that sometimes you are, you are trying to prove when you're uh, just being taught as in a designer and you're just fighting with a piece of paper or the model. Uh, so reality, gravity, uh, difficulty to, to arrive to how to weld, uh, all that matters too. So from that moment on, whenever you do draw a line, then you think twice. So you begin to feel some kilograms, if not tons, when you're drawing a line and you better make sure that the, what you're drawing has taken that into consideration. Uh, so after that, working in whatever, uh, finally in 97 and 98, I after this, so for my six years after graduating, I finally got the chance to work in what I studied for, which is doing a, a house and a building. House for Sculpture, and the Mathematics Faculty. Uh, and that is an opportunity that I will always be grateful because I had no connections in my family. Somebody has to believe in you when you have nothing to show. The, the, wh how on earth would somebody commission a building to somebody? I was so nervous, was almost living on the construction site. Uh, but I was so uh, grateful of that opportunity I was given by the dean of the school at the time, Fernando Perez. Uh, that uh, commission, that uh, mathematics faculty at the, at the university. And there, because I got rid of the anxiety and had some uh, experience in understanding the weight, then you understand that when you do, draw two parallel lines on paper, a couple of weeks or months later, this is hundreds of tons of concrete being poured inside the formwork. And uh, so I think it was a, it was a good waiting time uh, before, and, and I'm still here talking about the very narrow spectrum of tools that I was given in the university between houses and buildings. So when I was invited to teach at Harvard in the year 2000, um, then the problem started. Because, um, yeah, we, you're, you're invited to teach. Um, and you imagine, I never gave a lecture before that, all of a sudden you are invited to be a professor at Harvard, but you are teaching studio options and there are more professors than students. So you have to propose a theme 
and it could be that no student is interested. So after that, a, a couple of weeks, you left Chile saying, I'm going to teach at Harvard, and then you come back, nobody was interested in what I had to say. So what was their teaching at the time? So you had, there were three Pritzker Prize, uh, so was Herzog de Meron teaching, Rem Colhas teaching, Rafael Moneo, uh, and if I was a student, I would have chosen them no matter what they're teaching, so that's out of the question that uh, you will compete with them. Then the other third of the studios were uh, traveling, so the Tokyo studio or the London studio, the Middle East studio, so if I was a student just for being able to travel for free, uh, I would have taken those two. Uh, so what do you do with the rest? What can you say that is more interesting uh, than what these other two op uh, offers? Uh, so uh, cornered in that uh, dilemma, I thought, well, and out of, I would say out of uh, embarrassment, uh, because what matters at Harvard is, and I guess that's the question regarding academic institutions, you know, and particularly a polytechnic school like this one, is the critical, ma ma maths, uh, critical mass of people thinking on the edge of their own fields that then come together. Uh, so in the case of Harvard, I was uh, going to a dinner, four people, uh, the Minister of Housing of the time, a former student of Harvard, 33 years old, an engineer, a lawyer, and myself. And, and the conversation was around housing. And uh, they were, you know, it's like going to a match between uh, Nadal and Federer, you saw the ball, you know, at 200 kilometers an hour, and I was the architect in the table and wasn't able to say a word about, about what they're saying because I didn't know what a subsidy was. In a country where 60% of what gets built uses subsidies. So it was so embarrassing, uh, was not part of the uh, training I received, yet it belongs to the challenges of the built environment and actually is so much more, more than more than important. I wouldn't like to claim any kind of moral superiority here, but in terms of square meters, only in terms of square meters, uh, it's more than buildings and houses. Uh, so uh, the, the idea was to start teaching or at least addressing my ignorance in social housing. So that was the first movement to add tools to the toolbox because it was obvious that I didn't have them. And some of those tools are economical, are uh, political, are social, are environmental, and only eventually aesthetical. That was the uh, training I received. Uh, so, uh, and this may be the, the, the most important thing and it's connected to the couple of examples I will show later on. The cross-pollination in the office. Because that was the first project we did in, built in 2003 and uh, delivered to the families in 2004, working with the housing policy in Chile. And we will, we will go through this, but in, in a nutshell, $7,500 to buy the land provide the infrastructure and build the house. So that set of constraints was out of what I was trained for. I mean, constraints may be the most important word here. But even though that was outside, uh, even if actually it was outside the archi architectural realm, so it, in, in strictly speaking, social housing is, is a, an economical, a political, it's a policy issue, but we were entering, or I was trying to make sure to enter this non-architectural conversation by doing what I was trained for, which is design. So uh, at the same time we were doing social housing, I was building the math medical faculty of the university or this other, so I, I, I think mathematics school went well because the university kept on asking for another projects. And it was important that we always had this conversation between the more conventional practice of architecture and these non-architectural questions. And the reason or the dynamic of that cross-pollination was that even though social housing that was outside the toolbox I received, strictly speaking, it's non-architectural, 
the way you enter the conversation is by having the tools of a designer as sharp as possible and that uh, can only happen if you are tested or requested as an architect to deliver high quality design. But this kind of projects enabled me as at the time the, there was no office so I was just myself uh, but I, when I went to there, I knew the designer tools uh, were sharp because in here you were uh, required to work on the state of the art, on the cutting edge of your profession. But the, so the cross-pollination is a specific knowledge of architecture applied to a non-specific question like housing. But the other way around, in social housing with $7,000 per unit, you can guess that you are not given a single millimeter of room to answer with what's not strictly the case. Actually, the name elemental in Spanish is something that cannot be further decomposed. It's when you arrive to a moment of irreducibility. And that in social housing is a must. You are, you are given one hammer, one nail, one hit. You don't have a second chance. Families receive a subsidy only once in their lifetime. So you have one chance to, to answer what was uh, strictly the case, with what is pertinent. And that precision, or let's say elimination of the superfluous, I mean scarcity as a great antidote against arbitrariness, in housing is a need, is a, is a must. But when dealing with this type of projects, it's desirable. The moment you submit these projects to a kind of mental earthquake, where everything that is superfluous has been eliminated and falls down of the design, that attitude comes from the rigor of social housing. So we were tempering, let's say, this other end of the spectrum with the discipline of social housing to eliminate the superfluous. And this is the cross-pollination that ever since we've always been very careful to maintain that at any given moment in, in the toolbox where we have a, a both ends of the spectrum happening simultaneously. But again, in 2010, the toolbox proved to be incomplete once again. We had an 8.8 uh, .8 earthquake in the Richter scale plus a tsunami. And uh, in order to work in the reconstruction, in the we were uh, called to, to contribute to the reconstruction of a city in the southern part of the country, we had to go beyond the toolbox into the city scale, but at the same time in the emergency housing scale. Both of them were outside the toolbox and they're actually mutually uh, dependent. You need quality emergency housing to buy time so that the reconstruction doesn't I mean, have to be in the tension of do I rebuild fast or do I rebuild well? Well, normally it's one or the other. The moment you prepare families for two or maybe more winters uh, in, a, in an emergency situation, then you may buy yourself time so that the quality of the reconstruction is not affected. Uh, but uh, again, we were having to think at the scale that until then had not been the case. Uh, Constitution is a middle-sized city, 50,000 people, 80% uh, of the city was destroyed, and um, the question was, and we were discussing this this afternoon in the, in the studio, what when a, whenever a tragedy hits, what can in a city be changed that in under normal circumstances would have never been able to take place? Can you look at those things that business as usual would prevent from happening? And that was the question we had in mind and definitely the question of protecting the city against a tsu future tsunami was very high in the rank because Chile was not prepared for tsunamis. It's very well prepared against earthquakes, but not against tsunamis. So that required a change that in normal cities, only when you have this level of destruction, you can ask yourself, let's say, to change the center of gravity of a city. Otherwise, you are not able to, to do so. So this was, again, the need to expand the toolbox uh, that, uh, that we had until then. 
And uh, more recently, uh, even beyond emergency housing, there's another realm that we felt we were not prepared, uh, which is slum upgrading. 30 to 40 percent of the population in Latin America lives in informal settlements, no sanitation, I mean, no, 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 no property, no, no nothing, uh, no coordination. Uh, so with the IDB, Inter-American Development Bank, plus the Ministry of Housing of Chile and some NGOs, we are working on some prototypes of prefabrication, uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, engineering prefabrication for slum upgrading. And so again, jumping into a field uh, that uh, we had not been able to address un until then. What we call the USB, Uridad de Servicios Básicos, and at the same time we're uh, working in, uh, we we've been finally, after some decades, uh, being able to win some competitions. We took part in many competitions and never won. Uh, and finally, we may have understood uh, a little bit of how to address this issue of competitions in order to have access to projects that otherwise you'd never get a direct commission. Um, and and uh, j I will just mention it, and it will, may take too long to explain, even though I brought some images and it will be up to you then if we can discuss something that is not even in the line of the range of the built environment, the question of the Mapuche, which is, uh, it's outside the, the, the question of scale. It's in a different cosmology, it's in a different symbolic system, it's in a different understanding of what's the notion of civilization, and it's a different set of values. Uh, can you even, work there because there's a conflict, you're called to eventually deliver something uh, to contribute to, you know, find an understanding in the conflict. Uh, but again, so uh, this is the, the, the idea I wanted to, to share of how we're constantly, constantly required to expand the toolbox and then, you know, coming from different professions, different countries, uh, and I guess it might be the case that for all of you here, that you have tools that I have not idea that in the toolbox, and, it, and I guess that an institution like this one is the place to share tools that may the rest of the class or the uh, stakeholders may not be aware of. Uh, so again, at the same time that we were working with the project for the Mapuche uh, in this I don't even know how to call it. I actually haven't, doesn't have a word in Spanish. It's Kunu and Coyahue. Uh, so it's a place, where is place? Coyactun is a peace negotiations or parleys. Uh, so it's a place for peace negotiations. Uh, that, well, we, well if in case we talk about it, then, but then at the same time, we just won the competition for this bank in Switzerland, the uh, EDP uh, about to be finished in Lisbon for Energy of Portugal. Uh, or a project for the Inter-American uh, Development Bank Regional Office in Buenos Aires. Uh, so why try to expand the toolbox? Uh, because it's not just a question of, of diversity. I mean, there's a purpose in that. Uh, and I guess it's connected to that question of po force uh, cross-pollination. Uh, it's also because the more complex the problem, the more the need for synthesis. And I think at the very core of what we studied as architects is a very powerful tool, which is the design. Design, if anything, is synthetic. And, uh, and it would be a pity if for complex questions, we left design out of the table of conversations because it offers a very powerful tool that otherwise no other profession is able to contribute. But you have to understand your position. You are just one piece in a much bigger game. You may have a very powerful tool that is to organize information in, in a proposal key. It's not a diagnosis, it's not, it's not a report. Uh, the, or whatever you have swallowed, that's huge amount of information. You have to make a proposal and to jump into the void and that's something that we've been trained for and is not necessarily the case with other professions, so it would be a pity not to include that as part of a much bigger conversation. That, that I would say. And then you may have to make sure that you have the experience of a lot of constraints 
with cutting edge design to be able to answer and pick up from the toolbox whatever is pertinent. Otherwise, you, if you have your toolbox is too small, you will pick always a hammer because it's the only thing that is inside the box, and then whatever comes up to you, you will see them as nails. So depending on the nature of the operation, you may have to pick up the screwdriver or uh, the, yeah, so the more tools, the more you are able to ans answer in a pertinent way. So uh, that being said, I, I was thinking of, of showing maybe the, the, the Swiss project because it's more recent. Uh, then eventually something about housing and about what is the specific contribution of design, of form making into a non-architectural, non-formal problem. And finally, uh, the project, the project of the bank in Argentina, uh, because it may be the most worrying things that we're dealing with in Latin America, which is the, the issue of narco, you know, a parallel power uh, to the state. Uh, you may not be there here, uh, but the moment inequalities are in cities, and that's the problem with cities, they accumulate inequalities in a very concrete and uh, as a very concrete experience, then you're accumulating pressure as a social ticking time bomb. And that exploded in Chile in 2019. Uh, and right now, I mean, it, it showed a, a challenge for which architecture, I'm not sure, has enough tools. Again, there will be a need for expanding the toolbox again. Uh, so uh, um, something about that, that challenge of this uh, parallel reality of the narco world. Um, Bec because radicalism, I mean, to, to that extreme, to extreme, maybe happens with religions in other when when other societies have these uh, inequalities from a cultural, ethnical, or religious point of view. Uh, so maybe with these three projects, uh, we s we stop the first part, and uh, in case you're interested, we can address other ones. Okay, this is a, a competition we won maybe a year ago. It's for the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. Uh, it's kind of the central bank of the central banks. Uh, so, um, I, well, it's a competition in the shortlist was Foster, Herzog de Meron, Chipperfield, uh, Perot, Kuma, um, Big, so we had nothing to lose. You enter the competition, uh, and yeah, um, we've never done a bank, ne never something of that scale. And again, the the entering point is, and that's something I wanted to share. We talked in the studio this this morning. The the question of the equation is not because we, by any mean, believe architecture is a science, so there's a single answer, but it's very important that before giving an answer, we understand what is the question. Again, we may have received a brief, the competition brief, and that is a necessary condition, but we thought it was an insufficient condition. There were more issues being around the proposal that we thought had to be addressed, so the first thing we wanted to do in the competition was to make sure that we were not leaving forces that will inform the form of the project outside. So the equa this uh, kind of equation, I mean, it's just to identify the forces at play. Uh, and actually, last week, and it's, uh, or two week weeks ago, there was uh, the opening of the exhibition of the competition in, in Switzerland. So uh, it was a public issue. Uh, all the other office projects were uh, uh, presented there. So. Uh, First, there was something with the urban context. It was rel very relevant in a very tight plot, uh, so we had to respond to, just to name a, a few, you know. Uh, the, well, first of all, the very in Switzerland, you can imagine building codes and constraints. 
and uh, accept every single singular one of them. Uh, we were going from a building to a campus that was, again, it was, it was not said in the brief, but we understood that instead of adding a tower to an existing tower, uh, what was happening there was you're transforming a building into a campus. That's a different question. Uh, um, we thought it was important that whatever we did, we could give back to the city something, so it's not just for the private uh, client, but how are you a good neighbor? Uh, so regarding the context, then of course it had to work perfectly, so a clockwork in Switzerland, the workspace had to be very precise. Uh, and of course the question of, well, after the pandemic, why even come back to the office? That is a question that has been floating in the world uh, recently. In why don't we keep on working remotely? Well, I guess the answer is why we are all here. I'm traveling from Chile, from Chile you coming to a packed room. Uh, because I th we still be need physical face-to-face -face contact. Uh, over the internet, there may be information, but what we need is communication. To advance, to jump into un unknown fields, we need those body language, the uh, in between the lines. When I see people that are getting bored, you may change the subject, or if they're enthusiastic, you dip in the subject. Well, all that happens only if you are reacting emotionally to exchange of information. That's communication. Uh, so I guess that why, that's why we will keep on having to come back not only to the office, but physically to the workspace. And that's why it's so relevant if a student cannot afford to live in the city where it's supposed to study. Otherwise, everybody would be able to study from abroad, and that's not possible. You may get information, but not communication, and that's not part of the formation. Well, uh, just to, to name the things that we were trying to address, there was a question of, of time, guaranteeing business uh, continuity. Sustainability was very high in the rank. What are were going to be the design strategies to address uh, sustainability? But there was one thing that uh, again, when, whenever we try to um, design the question before jumping into the answer, is that some of the forces at play are very concrete, very tangible, measurable. You, it's very clear if you're performing it better or worse. But some of them are intangible, are symbolic or emotional. And even though it's very hard to measure or sometimes even hard to prove, is the first thing that hits you, or the first thing that may uh, create a problem uh, in the society, in an institution, in a group of people. So, coming from Chile, you know, with a social blast in 2019, it's a, it's a country where anybody with some level of power is suspicious. So we thought, and we said, uh, to the bank in the competition that uh, where they have the problem on the one hand of and, and this is the other thing that happens when you're you're forming these equations. It, it's very common that the forces you identify pull in opposite directions. They are contradictory. Uh, and instead, and one one way around would be to accommodate the question and you eliminate the conflict in advance so you guarantee a very beautiful outcome that then is published in a f fantastic architectural magazine or th you address the paradox and the inconsistence and the, the all the mess that it all is normally in the question. Uh, so in this case the forces pulling in opposite directions was on the one hand the need of a bank for privacy for uh, security. I mean, imagine a, a central bank of the central banks. Everything communicates. The moment you see somebody, a, a central banker of whatever country entering the building, immediately sends a message, oh, there's a problem here. So inflation rate, who knows what will happen with the stock exchange somewhere else? You never know. Uh, so there is a real need for that delicate treatment of the nature of the exchange that is happening in an institution, but the moment you create something that is too private or too close, this kind of, it's suspicious. So we, th we said, 
we, you need to be transparent. I mean, be, your, your business as a bank is to build trust, and in order to build trust, you have to be able to open your institution. So you have the need for transparency and privacy at the same time. Uh, so these are the kind of things that I uh, that we try to identify very early on, even though we may not have the solution, but at least we're not uh, or we're addressing the elephant in the room. That that is very important. So. Uh, the project, I'm not going to go maybe into too much detail, there was an existing tower from the 70s from the BIS and uh, they needed to add this uh, new proposal and uh, the strategies were very different from each of the final shortlist of architects. Uh, we went in the end for this uh, square plan uh, that is the most flexible, the most uh, reusable, the ones that we know that are that can stand the test of time in an easier way. We anticipated how difficult it may have been for the maintenance people in the round tower to change an office. Well, we got that conversation in the corridor talking to janitors and talking to the guy of, of, of maintenance of the building. It's a nightmare to change a room in a radial structure. Uh, so, but in addition, you see, uh, so, well, just again, you, the, the existing tower has this very organic shape, and uh, at the ground level, we wanted to match that, but not only for a formal question, but the moment you're creating these round shapes, we're widening the sidewalks. And that was very important in a tight part of the city. So the moment you have this kind of meandering silhouette, then the depth of the sidewalk uh, ca that can be uh, given back to the city. Uh, matters. Actually, when I was saying the question of accepting constraints, all the building codes pushed the height, the possibility of building height to that corner of the site, opposite of the tower. By doing so, but accepting that constraint, constraint, we were able to save the trees in the lower corner, existing trees that have embedded time. And that in principle, it's is expected to be able to be used by the city. And right now, it's a part of the private garden of the bank. Fantastic old trees. Wouldn't it be nice if, if privacy and security permitting that that corner can be offered back to the city? So these are the kind of, of uh, strategies that we were accepting constraints, saving the trees, better carbon footprint, but also a nice neighbor. So you try to tackle more than one issue at a time. <coughs> the, the whole part of the city is subject to a renewal, so that in that skyline, many new towers will appear. Um, it's close to the train station. And uh, regarding the workspace, um, this was our, our proposal, and again, asking ourselves why even come back to the office. I, and you know, well, those that have uh, work in, in an office space, you know, and before the pandemic, it was very normal that the brief was expressed to you as a designer in terms of how many desks were going to have to be accommodated in the building. Well, the desk work is something that is the best thing that can be done from home. Don't even come back to the office because at home, you're, you're not waste time in the traffic. You may be more concentrated if your kids are at a school or, well, in any case, desk work is not the reason. But the social dimension of the work, that's why you, we should keep on coming back to the office. So the, the occupancy rate of buildings, in principle, may shift from desks to lounges or chairs in the restaurant or coffee space or uh, how do you wait for the elevator. So it's the social dimension of the work that may be a way to, uh, I mean, that's why the office space this will make sense. So. The analysis we did was, well, in the old tower, the core is occupied by the building itself. You go out of the elevator, and in order to find another person, you have to go around the core. Otherwise, you don't even know who's working there. So we were asking ourselves, can we make the core explode and bring and separate the core in all the components and make it become a forest in the periphery? That is a kind of structure that works as a field instead of, you know, with a specific uh, uh, compressed uh, element. And the moment we liberate the center, <coughs> then the meeting space becomes more important than the view 
and the natural light. Of course, we have to keep that, and that's the advantage of the tower. But the empty core of the plan, the the place, the kind of central square in a tower, that was our proposal. In addition to that, we wanted, and, then to, and the, again, this addresses more than one issue. Normally, when talking about the sustainability strategy, you are required, okay, so was the, the the main source of the energy, or what's the carbon footprint of, footprint of the materials you choose. Uh, what is normally left outside is what about human energy? Why not walk? Of course you can't walk in a 110 meter high tower, but you can walk two floors. So what if we create these neighborhoods that in order to meet others, instead of calling the elevator, well it happens here in the building, uh, I was walking five floors up, maybe it's a, a little bit too much, uh, but two floors is nice, you know? So uh, that's a challenge of any vertical structure where you want to, f to create the conditions for meeting people. Uh, it's kind of contradictory in a high structure, creating the means to meet. Uh, but these were the strategies, empty core, uh, transparent elevator, so while going up you look at what others are doing. Who's working on the 10th floor that otherwise you go to the 25th floor and never know what the others are doing. Uh, but inside the neighborhood, that was exactly the size that the Swiss fire code allowed to have in concrete, uh, so with partitions of F120, you cannot achieve that easily with other materials. But inside this course, uh, we could have a wood structure. A wood skyscraper is still not very efficient. I mean, it's occupied by massive wood elements. Uh, so as a, as a kind of uh, show off of capacity, maybe a, a wood tower <laughs> could be done. Uh, but still is not efficient uh, with the building systems we have today. So uh, our proposal was to have a concrete structure every three floors, uh, and then inside a very low-tech wood furniture, uh, but that in addition to the carbon footprint, you know, <laughs> these structures in between, instead of being demolished, can be dismantled. You can change your mind over time. And, and flexibility and buildings. If you're going to spend energy, well, make sure that you spend it only once so that buildings last. The capacity of a building to adapt to change that we cannot anticipate nowadays, well, may have some material strategies that make it easy to change your mind over time. So would, from that point of view, made also sense from a functional and not just from an environmental point of view. Uh, and, well, this is an old version. This is the version of the competition. We have added much more uh, structural engineering. So, for example, in this version, instead of having the table sitting on the concrete floor, we're considering having cables so that the wood structure hangs from the uh, concrete uh, slab above, and that's even more flexible. It's, l it's, it's more open. So we, we have been adjusting and refining uh, the strategy, offering outdoor space in every neighborhood so that those gathering uh, spaces in, in between groups that actually is also coincident with what literary, literary literature shows is the size of, of human groups be, between 120 and uh, 120 and 150. That's uh, the size of a nomad, nomad tribe, a military platoon, a company divides up to 150. So it's a, it's a kind of natural anthropological unit uh, that can share uh, social spaces in height. So that's one project. I may be using too much time. Yeah, it's almost an hour already. So, um, so let me let me skip housing. Maybe leave just one thing which I think is important. Um, this is what my algorithm shows when I Google social housing in English. And this is what shows if I Google vivienda social in Spanish. It's a, I guess it's a very important to understand what, when I say social housing, you think of something that is completely different from what 
I think, when somebody says social housing. And uh, so I, this is just to show what a very specific design operation, like geometry, has to do, to to do with uh, creating wealth. And in the case of the first project, if I exaggerate the argument, I would say that the square was more efficiency to bring people out of poverty like a, than a rectangle. That sounds, you know, a, a long uh, jump, but I may have to prove that. Um, I need to skip that. Um, so again, this was the question we were required to answer back in 2003, uh, working within the housing policy, existing policy in Chile of $7,500 subsidy, provide a solution for 100 families that were living illegally in half an hectare site, so uh, 5,000 square meters, knowing uh, that that subsidy was going to be able to afford around 30 square meters of construction. And that site, because with the subsidy we had to buy the land, provide the infrastructure and build the house, that land cost was three times more than what social housing could normally afford. So how do you solve that equation? And you need efficiency, right? Uh, so the conventional notion of efficiency is that for a given area, let's say 100 square meter of a plot, uh, the narrower the front and the deeper the lot, the more efficient it is because you are serving more units or families with less street, less pipes. So that's why I guess that the, in every single city in the world you see that the plan is, you know, narrow fronts, deep lots for, this, for this, an X amount of area uh, in property. Uh, the problem with that, among other things, is that in the, when the plot is too small, and we're talking about 100 square meters in the case of the housing policy, <coughs> it is very normal that in Chile the plot is 7 by 14. Actually, there are many cases where the plot is 3 by whatever. So three meter wide, so it's the size of the room, not even the size of the house, uh, plus the size of the plot. But the, one of the consequences carries is that it requires to have streets every 28 meters. And that's very inefficient. You don't need that amount of streets, but you have to pay those streets with a subsidy. So you're using scarce resources in things that are not needed just because you're following even well intentioned, this conventional notion of efficiency. In the case of the project of Iquique, this was the plot that we received. The families were occupying this piece of land, uh, 5,000 square meters, that had too many corners. And a con let's say in that one, in a given block, yeah, you have a grid, and that's a kind of more normal. But when you have this very irregular shape with a rectangle, whenever you have to rotate, you lose efficiency. With a square, whenever you rotate, it doesn't matter. So a square enabled us to rotate more often without losing efficiency. And by being able to accommodate more families through a square, a house underneath and an apartment on top, we were able to prorate among more families the cost of the land. If you don't achieve enough density, you're not even to able to pay for the land. And uh, so, uh, yeah, the for $7,500 in, in Chile, this was what's being built. So that was the market. Th this was our um, benchmark. Uh, and we knew we had to do something that was in between a building and a house to make a more efficient use of land, but as a house being able to grow. And actually, the strategy, after a couple of years of brilliant minds at Harvard, uh, we arrived on the site, meeting with the families, and they have invented the same thing, that after two years at Harvard, an, a house underneath, an apartment on top, with a stair that actually it connects to a second generation of tenants, so house is a source of income. Uh, what they were unable to do was to provide the decent conditions for coexistence, no fireproofing in between neighbors, no public space. Uh, so actually the, the what 
was not invented, and what, what, what had been already invented spontaneously by the families. The how was the difference, and the how is something that we know what to do as a designers, the form. So had we had even less money, we were comfortable to deliver just this, and this is something, again, in the cross-pollination. More and more, the moment the structure is finished, the architecture should be finished. And this is an approach that we have been using lately. The, the architecture is, is depending too much on the skins, on the layers, on the, and, and, and the thing is the structure. I mean, everything beyond the structure is just frills. And, and well, it may have something. But uh, it can be done by others. So the final point was, and this is again, the difference between housing policies for developing countries, so two billion people in the world, housing policies are property oriented. When you get a subsidy, you become the owner of the house. Meaning a housing subsidy is the biggest transfer of public money into a family asset. And we would like that m asset to grow its value over time. But that's not the case in social housing. Normally the value goes down. Uh, so the the question of location matters a lot that's why density and we wanted i think is the next no it's not here uh but in any case by being able to uh eradicate don't eradicate instead of evicting families from where they were in the center of the city of iquique they would benefit on, from location and the, the problem was the cost of the land that's why the poor housing were being built outside the city, 45 minutes away, where land cost nothing. Uh, but in the center of the city, they not only have the, va the unit grow its value over time, but also they're integrated in the network of opportunities that cities offer. The, the school, jobs, going to the beach, uh, transportation, less time. So all that ref uh, it has an incidence, and after 10 years, you see those units at the initial cost of $7,500, if you go today and we want to buy one of those, it's $70,000. And that's uh, housing not just as a shelter, but as an economical tool. Um, so I'm going to jump into the last. I don't know how, how much are you aware of the, the Chilean situation, October 19, 2019. Uh, no, actually, this is October 18. Uh, in an increase of 30 pesos, is like something like 0 0.05 cent increase in the public transportation. This movement of civil disobedi disobedience by uh, school students, high school students, uh, that didn't want to pay for the uh, increase, uh, October 19th, the subway, uh, a, s a source of national pride. I mean, it was well-maintained, well-kept. All of a sudden, the station's being burnt. Uh, but not only that, suckings and lootings. I mean, something exploded there, actually, it was called the social blast, to the point that it uh, led us to question how we will be able to live together. And that was the, que the, na the title of the Biennale that year that Sarkis uh, organized, how to live together, how we will live together. And that was a very crucial, pertinent question for Chile. Uh, and here, I would say you can see two things. One, a legitimate uh, frustration, anger, resentment, of uh, again the inequalities expressed in the city in a, in a society that is not only uneven but in addition is segregated so you may wake up in the morning in the third world spend a couple of hours on public transportation to do stuff in the first world study work shop whatever it is and then by the end of the day you go back to the third world so no wonder you accumulate this level of rage of uh, why them not me uh, so it's not a question of poverty, it's a question of inequalities, what accumulates pressure in the built environment. And, and cities are good news, but if not managed properly, they can lead 
to this. Uh, but at the same time, of this uh, legitimate civil uh, anger, there was another parallel that was revealed by the blast, and that parallel power is the narco world uh, that was very interested in creating chaos because the moment the state doesn't arrive, then the rule of law is replaced by the law of the jungle. And there, they're much better in playing that game than anybody else. And uh, so what's the connection? When is, I mean, and then the narco world is extremely smart in identifying vulnerabilities. So they would enter whatever type of, of anger and resentment, conquer that, arrive faster than the state, uh, and, and create this struggle. Well, in any case, in, in Chile, the legitimate part of the anger went into massive uh, manifestations, 1.2 million people in Santiago in the main square, uh, and actually the, it, it was expressed in the end as the need for rewrite the constitution that was written under Pinochet. There was a gap in between what's legal and what's legitimate. 80% of the population voted to change the constitution back in uh, 2019, in November. Never ever in the history of Chile had been such an agreement on anything. Uh, a year later, after the proposal of the first text, two thirds of the population rejected the new constitution and the new proposal. So we went, let's say, from a neoliberal society that questioned to the bones, to the other extreme to rewrite the constitution than, uh, let's say, by the far right. Um, and then the new text went to the far left. Two thirds reject the new text. Third attempt, and this is not here in these slides, uh, for a second test, a text. Uh, so the people chosen for writing this uh, second attempt were from <coughs> mainly from the right that text was rejected again. So we've been bouncing back and forth between these polarities uh, that somehow is a kind of still, a kind of cold war. There's still left and right. There is still neoliberal versus communism. There is still, and, and, and again, this, it may be an interesting discussion uh, for the constitution and what I'm, trying to propose here is that what does this have to do with what happens in the peripheries mm -hmm. where the narco rule? For the narco, I mean, given the constitution is very an, a very abstract thing, the only thing that may matter is depending on who wins in this kind of cold war is how the narco will be fought, will be fight. The right proposes repression. And when you have, a, I mean, one of the neighborhoods that we're working in Chile, you, a young male, life expectancy is 24 years old. So when you're dying at 24, uh, who cares about repression? You have nothing to lose. I actually went to the Congress to make a presentation regarding the housing crisis, uh, but I was more worried about the non-city that the solution of the housing crisis may produce, because in that non-city, what you create, and for the lack of a better word, I was trying to describe the situation to politicians as Mad Max. What you have in the peripheries is Mad Max. I will show a, a film that uh, two weeks later I found. Had I found it, I would have shown it in the, in the Congress. Um, but let's say on the on the right, the the attitude is repression. When you have Mad Max, uh, repression is, is really relevant. I mean, it's uh, you, you or you put people in jail, and you will see in the in the film uh, for for the narco world, it's like remote working. I mean, you're totally fine in jail. You're operating in any case your your business from jail. Uh, but if you go to the to the left and propose, you know, the human rights and let's create opportunities, the narcos will laugh in your face, you know. So uh, the question is, again, going back to the question of the toolbox, it's very important that f 
Out of ideological reasons, we don't reduce the toolbox for how to address the issue. Because if we just, for ideological reasons, get, re get rid of the necessity of creating opportunities, which is you know, just repression, then uh, it, it is a never ending story. There are people, too many people that have nothing to lose. If you just focus on creating opportunities and, and, and live or create the police to have a, a, a veil of your, you know, a cab, your old cop, cops are busted, uh, then you're, you're creating a, a feeling that, uh, yeah, you can do whatever you want. Uh, so out of ideological reasons, we should try to make the effort of not reducing the toolbox, on the contrary, being able to expand it. Uh, so what I would like to show here is uh, three minutes from a film in the minute 59 of a film by Alejandro González Iñárritu called Bardo. You know, González Iñárritu won the Oscar for Birdman. Uh, this is a very strange film. If you see the film, you will find that it is not necessarily deal with these issues, but in the minute 59, these three minutes are the most accurate and sharp descri description of this parallel world of the, of the Mad Max that I had no words for. Uh, and what you will see here is a fictional character of a filmmaker is somehow himself. Uh, interviewing a narco uh, in jail in the US and then that narco explaining to that guy how he sees society. What is the debate there? So uh, I was in, in Madrid uh, a couple of weeks ago, Norman Foster was opening the institute, and while I was uh, giving the same, showing the same film of the walking bombs, I think that's the the notion, the walking bombs. People have done nothing to lose. I received this uh, message from Chile in one of the biggest slums in the southern part of Santiago. Uh, so this is a flyer that is circulating. Uh, so as you see, uh, so it's an honor to talk to you. This is not a threat, but we need a contribution from you of $20 to $200 every week so that we all work quietly. We have the location of your operations, your businesses, and your cars. We have the conditions to offer you security. We give our word, kindly yours, the bandits. So. Lo siento, tengo problemas de conexión. <laughs> a intentar en un rato. So, uh, so this is uh, the kind of reality that, uh, yeah, while, while delivering policies, no matter how smart you are, th this is the kind of things that the forces at play. Uh, what tools will be, be able to use there, I have no idea. Uh, but a quick, uh, a quick, so that we don't live on a too pessimistic note. Uh, it's slightly pessimistic, but not that pessimistic. Uh, so this is a project we, uh, we were asked to do for the Inter-American Development Bank uh, for regional office in Buenos Aires that if following business as usual, would have built the building in the financial district. But the president of the bank, a Colombian at the time, uh, Luis Alberto Moreno, uh, asked, so what if we build our headquarters in the slum? And the slum, Barrio, Barrio 31, Villa 31, 50,000 people living across the most richest neighborhood of, of Buenos Aires in Recoleta, uh, around the train station of Retiro. Um, and he actually went even further. He said, what if we measure our own building with the same standards we measure the projects that we finance, let's say a sanitation project for a government, wherever, then we ask that project to prove the economical value that it will generate or what problem would uh, prevent to happen. So can we use the same way of measure our own building? That's why we would like to do it in the uh, favela, in the center of the slum, in case it can trigger some change. Uh, so. Villa 31 looks like this. It's close uh, to the highway that leads you from the airport to, to Nuevo de Julio, the most important avenue. And you see it's a slum is around the highway, but also underneath the highway. 
with not just housing, but uh, all sorts of, of commerce, and uh, it's a very mixed use, let's say, as a type of urbanism. Uh, of course, the question of uh, no infrastructure, no sewage or water, uh, energy, and in here too, uh, people keep on building up, so housing is a source of income. Um, and again, half of the population of the slums are immigrants, illegal immigrants, but they come here and the city needs them as a workforce, and there's a mutual, uh, mutual uh, need of each other. Uh, so uh, the problem with Villa 31 is all those 50,000 people can go in and out only through a single entry point over there around the railway station, and then within one hour of walking, uh, they go to whatever the city has to offer. And But there are certain barriers there, like the highway or the trains. Uh, so in the analysis we did for the bank, uh, we said, okay, um, if you plan to do the building in the slum, well, first, you cannot do it on the ground level. You would occupy the only open green space that is uh, there. Uh, that That is the scarcest resource in slums is public space. I mean, nobody can guarantee that it's not taken uh, over. Uh, um, but then it wouldn't even follow the, the uh, manual in Washington for bank offices. I mean, that requires natural light and the view, so maybe if we elevate the building, we may comply with that code, still not a good landing as a neighbor. But in addition to that, uh, we would have to build at least two roads for security reasons. Uh, not we, actually, the city of Buenos Aires and some connection to the public transportation. So with we said, look, uh, to ask for the city to build all this for you to go into Islam is really politically non-viable. Uh, so our recommendation is not to do the building in the slum. Actually, it won't trigger the development that you're planning. So that may have meant us to lose the project. Unless, instead of asking the city for the four conditions to build your building, your own building is the four conditions. So if the building is that, uh, that actually is a 240 meter long bridge, the span is 110. We were working here with the same German engineers, SBP, that were uh, working in, in Qatar. Uh, they said, span, no problem. Uh, the problem is the vibration. So we need weight. So we, the park on top is the addition of weight that in, uh, also increases the uh, public space of greenery that was uh, very uh, deficitary. Uh, so if the current condition, and this was the question of proving value. Uh, within one hour, a citizen of the favela, of the uh, Villa 31, would have access to this amount of jobs within one hour of, wo of walking, and this amount of institution of health, education, cultural recreation. After the shortcut is built, within the same hour, you multiply job access by four, and then all the uh, opportunities that cities concentrate by even more. Uh, so the, the operation of the bank uh, may, in this case, improve the development, both of a mutual for the city, uh, but also the question of, of the emotional responses. When talking to the people of the bank, for example, uh, some staff were saying, especially women were saying, but what if I have to uh, end working rather late preparing a report, how do I walk out of the uh, of the slum? I don't feel safe. Uh, the moment you have a bridge, you go out, you have already a foot in the formal city, so that kind of emotional responses, people were uh, willing at least to consider the opportunity of doing so. So I guess that uh, even with a very specific operation, uh, the, the, the only problem is that this project um, that made sense, we presented in the board in Washington, made sense uh, to the board of countries that formed the IDB. Um, the problem was that we had to pass a law in the Congress for the, air, the use of air rights, because the railways is federal land 
and the slum is in the city land. And there was no law for how to use the air rights on top of the railway. And the problem in, uh, in Argentina is that normally the mayor of the city is the political opposite party of the president. And so normally block each other's initiatives. You see the connection of a uh, highway. It took decades because they were blocking each other's project. Uh, so it was understood that we have a window of opportunity to approve the project and the voting in the Congress by three votes. But then it was approved by, by a large majority, like 50 against 14 or something like that. So there may be a chance that design aligns the forces the moment you are offering solutions that are literally out of the box, out of the toolbox in this case. Uh, yeah, but the, so the project was developed to the last detail, detail engineering, uh, ready for, uh, for public bidding. Uh, but then president of the bank changed. Uh, Trump appointed for the first time a non-Latin as a president of the bank. The same guy was then accused of sexual harassment, was kicked out, but at the time was uh, enough for the project to keep on slipping. So it's not officially dead, but who knows? And But I guess, but this may be a possible tool, and I say it's the one, but the kind of things that, how to deal with the, with the law of the jungle and bring it back to civilization, to the rule of law, by offering opportunities in addition to uh, visibility and uh, mutual benefits uh, to address the, the issue of the parallel power of narco that otherwise uh, I think is, is very worrying. Thank you so much.